Oh, let's see. Y'all are at the bottom. <coughs> I'm rocking out of nowhere. All right. Okay, so any other questions about that? I'll move on. Yes, ma'am. Or comments. Is it true that there are missing books of the Bible that were not put in? I've heard this off and on over the years. Are That's there, a great are question. Really? That's a great question. Are there hidden books that didn't make it? Yeah, or scriptures. No. Or <laughs> There are no, that's a great question. And again, I was in Da Vinci Code and all this. It's just a common drum that people beat. Every book, every shred of documents that has been discovered, there have been a lot of them, all of them have been found. Not all of them have been translated, but every single major literature work, major letter, book, or document that has been discovered has been translated for the first at least 200 years. And you can go read them. A lot of these things you can read for free now online. You can read, you can just read them. There's all kinds of Christian literature. Christian literature, they kept writing literature, kept writing literature. Third, fourth, fifth century, you've got all kinds of documents. And in scholarship, we're forced to read all this stuff. I mean, I've read, we have whole collections of these documents. And it's sensational and sells a lot of books and gets Bart Ehrman a lot of money. And others at Barnes & Noble to go, we found the lost books. And then if you're a Protestant, as we are, and you're not exposed to these other books that Orthodox churches use or Roman Catholics might use, like, where have they been all this time? They were there all along. It's just they didn't make it to the Protestant canon. So the Protestant Bible has 66 books together. Roman Catholics and Orthodox have more than that. Ethiopic Orthodox have more than that as well. And Coptic, so that, they add books, but don't take them away. So there are no secret books of the Bible. There are no secrets. Another thing that goes along with that is a common assumption that the Pope or the Roman Catholic Church blocked these books to make it. That's absolutely false. The documents of the canon, as I just stated, were already considered scripture by the 300 at the latest. There was no Pope overseeing the church by then. The, the bishopric, the Papacy of the Roman Catholic Church really didn't get ascendancy until Pope Leo in the 480s. So we're talking, let's say 400s and be conservative. There was a bishop in Rome, but he did not oversee all the churches. There's, the point is, there simply was no chief authority who said, no, 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 keep that book out. It didn't exist that way. Greek-speaking churches, Latin-speaking churches, Coptic-speaking churches out in Egypt, they all worship on their own, however they wanted to do it, and they had a loose association of different regions, like an association of churches. And they shared documents and did things together, but no one ruled over the different cities. That took a long time for them to start raising up and raising up, and then all of a sudden Roman bishops saying, no, we rule over everybody. And that made a lot of people ticked off. And the East, you've gone crazy. The Greek speakers versus the Latin speakers said, when, when did that happen? Oh, it's always been there since Peter, and that made them upset. So there's no power in play, no one blocks out the books, and no one makes sure certain books gets in. That can it did not happen. So the answer is no. If you want to read more books, I'm, I'm really, I'm more than happy to recommend compendiums or collections of documents and books or portions of books. You can read them all you want. But they're not scripture. They're not scripture, that's right. Most Protestants would not consider scripture. Most divisions of Christianity don't consider most of the books written scripture. Because there's so many, there are hundreds of them. So even Roman Catholics and Orthodox, they have more than we do, but they don't have hundreds of more. They might have ten more, eight more, six more. But not fifty more and a hundred more. Do they consider them scripture? They have certain texts scripture that we don't consider scripture, yes. That's right. Well, this, this Bible here, the New Interpreter Study Bible, mm -hmm. which is my favorite, mm -hmm. It says New Revised Standard Version with the Apocrypha. Of course, if you're Catholic, you don't call it Apocrypha. Right. So, but if you're Roman Catholic, this is Scripture. Mm -hmm. You read for, for worship and edification and discipleship. Protestants in the Reformation, so now we're fast forwarding to the 16th century, they also read from the Apocrypha. They printed it in the earliest Bibles, but they found that people started making arguments against it, and a lot of churches stopped reading it, so they stopped printing it just to save money. Does the Latin Vulgate? The Vulgate has it's an Old Testament, so the Vulgate is a Latin translation of the Old Testament. So there are zero New Testament documents in the Vulgate, and the Vulgate was around by the fourth century. Most early church fathers, like Jerome and others who translated it, they use the Latin translation of the Old Testament. 
So when they talk about their Bible, and they quote from the Old Testament, it's from that blessed Vulgate, which is, it's not that good. It's a, not radically loose, well, some places, but it's a loose paraphrased translation of the Old Testament. It's close, but not that close. And so today, like in your, in, there I hear, here's an English translation of it, in your English translation, that's not from the Vulgate. They take that straight from the Hebrew text or the Greek translation of that, which is the Septuagint. And that antedates it by several centuries. It's much more accurate. The Vulgate, no. But the early church fathers used the Vulgate. Or the Septuagint, which is the Greek. Because they spoke Latin or Greek. They couldn't read Hebrew. Most of them couldn't. Now, Jerome could. That's why he translated to Latin. But most people couldn't read Hebrew in the time. They're from Rome or Asia Minor. Like, what's Hebrew? So what he said would go. What he said would go, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, some other people could read Hebrew too, but as far as we know, I mean, he said he went and consulted rabbis and tried to learn Hebrew from them. Uh, one of the guys, well, the only, I had a, on my, just for nerd talk, in my dissertation, and you have a committee of people, they're all specialists who can't wait to tell you what you've done is wrong. I mean, they're there to help you, but anyway. Not really. Um, they are kind of. What, I had to bring in an outside specialist because I had a couple chapters in the rabbinics. I had to quote a lot from the Hebrew, from the rabbis, from the Talmud. Well, no one at Baylor is a, has a specialty in the rabbinics, and so we had to get an outside, what they call readers. I got an outside reader of a guy who specializes in Hebrew and rabbinics, and he's a, uh, that's his specialty. And his dissertation was on Jerome, and the question was, did Jerome know Hebrew well? Basically, how did he do? So his whole dissertation... And his final conclusion is basically, yeah. I mean, he didn't that great, but yeah, he knew it. Well, I can't even write this. I don't have a daggum clue. I don't. I took two or three semesters of Hebrew. But, so people study that stuff and decide how close was he based on what we know about other documents and blah, blah, blah. The answer is apparently he did a really good job. That doesn't mean his Vulgate's a very good translation. That's a different, different issue. So that's more than you ask, but these are great questions. These are really good questions. What other question comments do you have? Go ahead. Well, Thomas comes to mind. Okay, Thomas. I just heard that it wasn't included. <laughs> oh, good. The Gospel of Thomas. Gospel. Very good. The Gospel of Thomas gained a lot of popularity back in the 90s, particularly with a group called the Jesus Seminar. Uh -huh. The Jesus Seminar was founded by a guy named Robert Funk and some other people, particularly in California and some other universities, who got together to decide whether or not they think the sayings of Jesus or are authentic. And they would use marbles and stuff, red, black, they had different ways of categorizing what they think. And it was hugely sensational on the news and group of Jesus scholars, it's called the Jesus Seminar, they must be specialists. They got together and determined like 20% of what Jesus actually said, said in the Gospels is authentic. Oh, and it was a big deal. And what they said was, one of the reasons why they determined only a small portion authentic is because they argued that Gospel of Thomas antedated or was earlier than the Gospels we have. And so it became their foundation to judge the rest of it. That's one of the things they did. Um, most New Testament scholars in the world find that all fallacious and nonsense. Most in the world do. That it, but it sure sells books. That's awesome. It makes it a CNN. It makes it, that's very popular. But if you went to Society of Biblical Literature, the premier scholarly place in the world, all the scholars hang out and study and present papers and chew each other out, they don't take the Jesus Seminar that seriously um, for a lot of reasons. So the Gospel of Thomas really came to its popularity back then. And about every Christmas season, it'll be brought up, I mean, the Easter season, it'll be brought up again in Discovery Channel or something and say, did you know? And there's a guy named John Dominic Crossan. He talks like this. He's an Irish man. He's got white hair and he's real little. He talks kind of like a leprechaun. He's real cute. And, um, and he's real good, I think, with parable work. But Johnny Preston, he goes to the Gospel of Thomas all the time. They love to interview him. And I don't like labels, but he's about as absolute liberal as you can get. He didn't believe in the resurrection. He calls himself a Christian. Um, but he thinks the Gospel of Thomas should be considered very primitive. And that's what it is. It's a document written that he argues. Most scholars do not think that for a lot of reasons. Most scholars think that it was written in the second century, at least 150 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, at least 100 years after the Gospels were written. So most scholars think the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, probably in this order, remember Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, probably written in that order, 
And then about 100 years later, a group of Coptic Christians in Egypt blended together some Egyptian, basically, I'm making this simple, theology, their understandings about religion, and they blended with Christianity, and they wrote a book. And this kind of Christian movement was called Gnosticism. And they had very particular theological slant. And most scholars in the field think Gospel of Thomas is a Gnostic document from that community. And that it does not accurately represent the teaching of Jesus. Having said that, some things in the Gospel of Thomas might be authentic. Okay. They might be. They might be, and there's a reason why we'd study it. In my PhD, I had to study it. When I did papers on parables and so forth, I used that document as a source. Um, be because it is an ancient document, but then you have to argue. A lot of times it's just comparing and contrasting. But if you're going to argue that this relates to an authentic saying of Jesus, you've got to make an argument for it. You can just say, it says in the Gospel of Thomas, if that makes sense. So scholars read it, scholars study it, most scholars do not think it's within the first century. And that's why the church probably did not consider it scripture. Because it didn't come from the original Thomas. That's enough explanation. Gotcha. <laughs> so, and you can read the Gospel of Thomas. All of you can. You can go online and read it. It's not that long. So there's nothing to be scared about it, really. If someone says, what about that? Go read a Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of... Um, Infancy narrative of you can read all kinds of so called gospels that were written, almost all of them written second, third, fourth centuries. But you can read all of them, there's no secrets. Great question. Thank you. Anything else or comment? Good question, too, on Gospel Thomas. Okay, what did the early church fathers say about it? You with me? Let's go to bottom page two. Let's start out again, I'm skipping around. Polycarp, he lived around 80 70 to about 160. You gotta read about Polycarp. Some of this probably is a lot legendary, but still, it's a really, really cool. Polycarp was was martyred. He was supposedly burned. Uh, the lions came out to eat him. They wouldn't eat him. And his final speech before the crowd is just amazing. Uh, all these years, my Lord has been with me. All these seventy years, my Lord has been with me. How can I deny Him now? I mean, it's just a really moving speech. He was the bishop of Smyrna. I put this description. He was a, he was according to legend. He was a disciple of John the Apostle. The original John the Apostle. I don't see any reason to doubt that. Anyway, what I'm trying to do now is, this is how the early church fathers and patristic, apostolic and patristic fathers, talk about triadic, Father, Son, and Spirit. They do it all, the stinking time. O oh Lord God Almighty, I bless you and glorify you through the eternal and heavenly high priest Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom be glory to you with him and the Holy Spirit, both now and forever. That is an early triadic confession. Well, I'm trying to make the point, they said it a lot, too, it is not a late development. The earliest evidence we have is that they put Jesus and the Spirit up there with God the Father Almighty. Justin Martyr, who lived, we're not exactly sure, but early 2nd century, he was an early church apologist, he defended the faith. For in the name of God, the Father, and the Lord of the universe, and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then received the washing with water. I'm just giving, these are obviously just snippets of quotes from this is first apology. This is baptism. About At the time, yes, ma'am. Yes, that baptism. That's right. Yeah, very good. Again, these are not, uh, please don't think that these are all the early church fathers I'm quoting from. I'm just giving you a few examples. There's tons and more. Ignatius of Antioch, he's the bishop of Antioch. That was, Antioch was the earliest hub of the Christian movement. Because after Jesus died, resurrected, then in t the temple fell in AD 70. And then the Christians were kind of pushed out for a while, both because Jews persecuted them and it was a mess. They went up north to Antioch. Not that far north, but just a little bit north. And so Antioch became a hub. I gave him joy to give you. Oh. And that's pretty cool. So this guy was the bishop of that place. This guy would have known a lot of the earliest apostles. In Christ Jesus our Lord, by whom and with whom be glory and power to the Father with the Holy Spirit. Oh, Ebba. Irenaeus, that's pronounced Irenaeus. Top of page three, Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon. This is, I give a long, he wrote all kinds of, he wrote a document called, again, the English translation is against heresies. And we learn a lot about the so-called heresies from him. Oh, if we only had the other group's documents themselves, 
Often, alas, we do not. We only have people's refutation of them. So we're always, do these really represent their views? We're not for sure, but that's all we got. It's like a one-sided conversation of email. That's all we got. The church, though dispersed throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith. One God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Does that sound familiar so far? Let me pause there. Have you ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. Come on, I know Catholic background. Yeah. You say, well, why are we doing that? Because later on, the so-called Apostles' Creed, it comes from things like these. These confessions started off almost certainly in prayer, like I said, in worship, but also in baptism. And so we see this becomes formulaic. So the so-called Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, I believe in God the Father, make him, that had been, that's an old, old expression, been used for a long time, by the 300s. Okay. Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and of the sea, and all the things that are in them. That's a quote from Genesis, of course. And in one Messiah Jesus, one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed to the prophets the dispensations of God and the advents, that is the comings, the co two different comings, his coming birth and his, his second coming, and the birth of a virgin and the passion, the resurrection of the dead, the ascension into heaven, the flesh of the blood of Christ Jesus, our Lord, and his manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father, to gather all things in one, and to raise up anew all flesh of the whole human race, in order that to Christ Jesus our Lord, and God, and Savior, and King, according to the will of the invisible Father, another quote from Scripture, every knee should bow, as Philippians 2, and of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, da, da, da. Um, you ought to see how much, I told you they quote from Scripture, I told you earlier, I'm telling you they quote from Scripture. If you read a good annotated early church father document where that the editors have put footnotes, it is there are hundreds of thousands of quotes. In fact, in one reference I saw for several centuries, it was over a million citations from the Bible. I mean, they quoted left and right, oftentimes from memory, or they were paraphrasing. So it's not always an exact quote, but it is astonishing. You can recreate, I think it's around 94% of the entire New Testament just from their quotations. If we lost every ancient manuscript of the New Testament, and you just read the, New Te the early church fathers, you'd have almost the entire New Testament. That's how much they quoted from it so often. So, anyway, there we go. There's a lot of scripture in there. So, yes, ma'am? Would their language have had the world in it? Would their language have had the world? I mean, I guess I'm thinking of Columbus and you know, the trepidation of sailing the seas because, oh, right. you know, you're going to fall off the face of, you know, a cliff or something. Yes, they did have a word for world, okay. but their concept of world was not like our concept of world. Okay. Yeah, they sure did. They could use the word gi, if you're speaking Greek, they would use the word gi for earth, uh, which later on in the Nordic and in the other places that came to Mother Gaia would be used for Mother Goddess of Earth. To this day, if you witchcraft, that's from the old Greek. I can spell it if you want. Or they would say world, the cosmos. We were good with cosmology and stuff, but they would mean the created order. In Latin, use different. Uh, they, anyway, they use different. They would use humus. They were hence the word human for dirt or whatever. So they had words for it. But the scope of a sphere, they probably there's some evidence they believe it's spherical. But the scope of the earth, all that, there's just no way. We don't have indication that they understood the scope. Let me say it that way. They had the words they used in. Yeah. Correct. Which is, I say, not to open this can of worms, but when Noah's flood kills the whole earth, I say in a blog, does that mean it really flooded the entire earth or not? And scholars like to debate that. Noah would not have had, as far as knowing any concept of the earth meant, North America, what we call it, right? Antarctica and whatever. That doesn't mean it didn't flood the whole earth. It just means, did he think that when he wrote it, whoever wrote it, that Noah flood? So there's a word for it, but their concept is probably not the same. But anyway, that gets some people very upset. But that's my job. No, I'm just kidding. Tertullian was a very well-known Latin author, very, very well-known. And he said, we define that there are two, the Father and the Son, and three with the Holy Spirit. Don't forget him, three's, three's a party. And this number is made by the pattern of salvation, which brings about unity and trinity. Woo! It's one of the earliest, if not the earliest known record of it in all literature. Interrelating the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are three, not in dignity, but in degree. Not in substance. They're not three different substances, because that would be three different gods, but in form. 
not in power. They're not three independent powers, because that would be three different gods, but in kind. They are of one substance and power, because there is one God from whom these degrees, forms and kinds, devolve in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is one of the earliest known attempts to explain what we call Trinitarian theology. And it is problematic, but brothers try it. Because every time he uses a word to describe God, people come back later and say, wait a second, you can't say that because that sounds like this. You can't say like, and then, I'm about to start that in a second because it gets really, well, confusing because they start debating words a lot. But I this like is. That description. What's that? I like that description. You like the description? Yeah. Good. Totally would appreciate that, I bet. Yeah. Uh, so this is perhaps the earliest known reference to Trinity in, uh, in the world. A little footnote nerd talk if you want to go look at the original documents. Did you know there's a whole library? Uh, you see PL, look at the end of that quote. It says, in adverse prax, it's in Latin, that means adversius praxius, that means against praxius. And it says PL2. PL is uh, Patrilingua Latina. Oh, Pat, Patriota Latina? It's been a while. Uh, but it means the Latin fathers in Latin. There's a collection. If you go to the library, I'm sure KU has it. Down our local library a lot, but they love it. But KU probably, I'm sure, has it, the religion department, or classics. If you study anything, in, like if you went and studied a degree in classics or studied Rome, it would cover that wall almost. Of, uh, I remember because at Baylor, there was one wall, all green volumes, green and blue. And it's every single document we have that's written in Latin for centuries. And then every single document we have that's been written in Greek for centuries. And several years ago, that whole series, that's a lot of stuff. They're small books. I mean, they're small, they're like this size. And think about those thin, they're filling up a wall. It's a lot. Well, a few years ago, they built all those digital. And so you'd have to go, now it's probably a lot easier. Um, but at the time, well, it did become, in my, my dissertation stage, it became easier. At the time, you had to go to the library and search on a special computer that database and you could search in Greek and Latin for certain phrases or words and pop up every single reference of every single volume in the original language. Then you had to go pick the volume off of itself and look up every single one of them. Um, then it became where you could do it digitally just on the website because they would give you access to get to the library. That became fast. I did that. That became super duper helpful. Um, but anyway, PL means that's the exact Latin volume. And boy, is that frustrating. My dissertation, I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of footnotes from different Greek and Latin sources. And, um, and I remember saying, I, did, I didn't want to cite the original because I had to look up all of them up. If that, anyway, the, because it's the standard way to do it. And my, my mentor said, yeah, you got to do that. I'm like, oh. So that took a long time. So uh, just to have it, just is what you got to do. So by force of habit, you see me put it there as well. PL2, 1367. Okay, enough nerd talk for that. So this is just a Cliff's note, quick introduction to the early church fathers saying that what we've said over and over, they just pick up where the Bible left off and they keep saying, Father, Son, and Spirit. Any questions or comments about any of that so far? I'm going to introduce the next section and we're going to stop there though, because I don't want to get too good. Any questions or comments? Anything? Has our youth minister had the kind of training you have? That's a great question. Has our youth minister had the kind of training? Yes, the kind of training, yes. His undergrad is in youth ministry. I didn't have that field, but he did have Greek. But he's had a much shorter span. Correct, he just has an undergraduate. He just got enrolled and just started in an MA, a Master of Arts, in, what is he doing? Man? In something, but it's online. It's a, I can't remember the school now. He's, it's a university, and he's doing it. He just, when he got the job here, he started there, too. Um, but I just asked, I asked him yesterday, what do you think he'll do long term in your life? And he said, well, I'm, right now he's very, very wants to be in a local church. He said, but I can see myself wanting to be a teacher, maybe at a university. Um, he likes to learn. He did a lot of Greek as an undergraduate. Um, so all language stuff, a lot of the same authors. That's one of the things that appealed me to him coming here when I saw his resume. Because he also had a bunch of additional documents of people he reads. And in the field, we can tell real quickly whether you know what you're talking about, the people you read, what theological slants you have. And um, I love to read. I love all of them. Yes, 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 yes. So I was very intrigued right away. Um, well, I just yeah. like the fact how comfortable he seems with all of us. 
Good. I like that. Good. And hopefully he'll keep going and get his education farther. I mean, get his master's and get his PhD, hopefully one day. Um, and he's 25, so he's got a hopefully a long, hopefully a long life to keep his degrees. But he loves to learn too, loves to think and learn too. Yeah, that's great. I think I think we're blessed to have him. And not just for nerd talk. It means, as I told him and I told this committee when we were looking for candidates, we we want to try to find the most qualified people in the field we're hiring them for. So when they talk to youth in college students, they go, oh, I don't know, Trinity, it's like three pieces of water and an egg. We don't know. We <laughs> Why not try to expect the best? So that was, I was glad to get them. Uh, how's that again? Okay, good. Any questions or comments? Anything else? Yeah, I'm going to open up a can of worms. Can, can of worms. Bring it. <laughs> Bring the okay. worms. We've got the Jews back in the day. Jews back in the day. Okay, go ahead. I'll okay, finish. We've got the Gentiles. Uh -huh. Okay? That's all you ever hear about them. Jews and the Gentiles. And then you have the priests, okay? But then somewhere along the way, where did Catholicism come from? The Pope. Where did that develop? And then you've got Mormonism, and then you've got mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, all these different isms. All these isms, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So where did Roman Catholicism start? Yeah, you, you've got the Christians, you've got the Jews. Where did Catholicism come from there? That's a great question. Roman Catholicism, to ask when did it start, is a bit tricky because it's a development. Yeah, because it's not in the Bible. Correct. And so it's hard to say that's the year it started. Yeah, so but let's call this, I mean, so this is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Where does it jump in there at? Let's call that the 30s. No, 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 no. Around the 400s. Uh, well, technically speaking, around 480. A guy named Pope Leo mm -hmm. the First, Pope Leo the First, he writes something called the the Tome of Something, which just means the document. It's not a tomb; it's a tome. Well, it's called the Tome of Leo, I think. T O M E. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. <laughs> In my mind, that was so weird. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, like, that sure is ironic. Um, and he argues. He argues. Now, he's not the only one who had argued it before, but he really makes the argument that the bishop at Rome was the bishop of every church, okay. going back to Apostle. So again, where does this pope and this bishop come from? I mean, he's a bishop. Catholicism had to start before you got the bishop and the pope. So You, know, you had to have the Catholic it. religion. Well, yeah, okay, there's maybe a little confusion of terms. Catholic comes from the Latin word Catholicus, which just means general, standard, universal. So Roman Catholic means the universal church under the leadership of Rome, the Roman universal church. So where did it first start? Different pastors, leaders in Rome back in the 40s and 50s started having, they planted churches. Like they plant a church in Lawrence, plant a church in Wichita, plant a church in Kansas City. They plant a church in Rome. The Apostle Paul writes a document, Romans, that we call Romans, to several house churches in Rome that had already existed by the time he writes it. He writes it probably the late 50s, early 60s, and by then he hasn't been it, but they're already there. That's within 20 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Several house churches already exist in Rome. Well, those churches certainly grow and grow. We have early church fathers from the period. It grows more numerically, grows more numerically. And then chief leaders arise as the main person who oversees the different churches. Probably because they have association with a, 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 an apostle or with a disciple of an apostle. That is, I have a direct, the guy who taught me was John himself. <laughs> and then that would be right to be Ignatius or whoever. The guy who taught me is this. That same thing I just described happened in Egypt. It happened in Antioch. It happened in Jerusalem. It happened in different four or five major areas of church growth. And the churches in town work together and different leaders get more and more ascendancy. What happens in the Western church, the West, in Rome, where they speak Latin, over in the East, they speak Greek. They speak Greek. The east is Ephesus, Philippi, or Philippi, Thessaloniki, 
all Antioch, that's Eastern Church. They all speak Greek. Early church councils are all in Greek. What happened was, all and down south is Jerusalem and Egypt, and all these different major areas grow up, have different ways of interpreting Scripture. They're similar, but they're different. Right. And we'll talk about some in just a second. We really, and we're about to, next, we're going to go in and say, here's some demonstration of those differences. I'm going with, I'm answering your question. As they raise up, they're independent, but relate together, copy documents, keep writing documents. Rome, around 400s, Right around 460, it happened a few times, but around 460, Alaric the Great sacks Rome. And so these barbarian tribes, as the Romans called them, sacked Rome. And it was one of the major sacks. It was a big, big, big deal. It spread like ripple effect, earthquake, all through the Roman Empire. St. Augustine uh, bemoans it. If I were saying goes to other authors, oh my goodness, the world is coming to an end kind of thing. Um, and they keep going on, but it's a big deal. But when Rome really falls after a series of being raided and sacked and raided and sacked, the Roman Empire just crumbles. There's no more government. There's no more military. It all is good. Well, when the Roman army is defeated and all these local barbarians rule into town, who takes over? Well, some of the barbarians. But what group is left over that wasn't fighting, primarily? The church. So these Roman Christians start baptizing the raiding barbarian horde and give them Christian names. That's the background of that. They start baptizing them. And they teach them how to speak Latin and read Latin. And guess what they use to teach them how to speak and read Latin? It's the Bible. Scripture. They use the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Bible. And so they learn how to speak Latin by learning the Bible. And then what happens is, since now the church is the last, last man standing, basically, the land that was now once ruled by Rome, the church takes over. And then they start paying taxes to the local church peeps. So you gotta you gotta pay them. So like basically overnight, within several decades and fifty years, hundred years, these leaders in Rome and the church skyrocket in gargantuan wealth, land, power, prestige, all over the Roman Empire. And then what happens is they divvy up the land not so much by countries, but by bishoprics. That is, they're under the leadership of the local church authority. Well, it's about that same period. The good old Pope Leo and other people like him say, did you know, we're not just the leaders of this, we're leaders of all the churches all over the place. And they make the argument that we go back to Peter himself. He was in Rome, where we know where his tomb is, and we, we can trace our ancestry all the way down. Every bishop has been anointed, basically, and blessed, basically, from all the way to the very beginning. And they kept fighting. The Eastern Church said, you've gone crazy. And so they never agreed. But they kind of develop and develop and develop, develop and develop. Well, develop. over time, of course, there are more and more of these popes have more and more authority in the West. The church, you know, they just baptize all these barbarians. And this goes and grows and grows and grows. And their power just grows. And the, the authority and then the cathedrals start getting built. Um, and then, after a series of disagreements with the Eastern Church over theology and this constant thing of where you need to submit to the Roman Church, they don't get along very well, on and off, on and off. In 1054 A.D., the, from the west, in one of the Crusades, are passing through town, through a town called Constantinople. Today it's called Istanbul. They're going to Constantinople, and they're on the way down to the Crusades to Israel to, to free Jerusalem from the Muslim hordes. And there's a dispute in town. And the eastern church says, we got this, we got this, don't worry about it. The story is the Crusaders, instead of going, God bless you, we're going to pray for you, they go crazy, apparently, and just burn the town and loot it and do all kinds of bad things to say, like, forget you. That's it. And that starts with, that, that causes what's called the schism of 1054. At 1054, the Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, split forever. And they're still friends. They're still, that's right, they're still not together. It's 2017, that's what happened. So theology and mainly, and this idea that we do not report to the Pope was the major thing. And so... If you read the, have you read my newsletter yet this year, this month? Wait. Have you read my newsletter yet for this month? No, no. Okay, I hope you do because on the cover, uh, the end of this month in October, the last Sunday of October is called Reformation Sunday every year. It's the day we celebrate what Martin Luther did in the 1500s, 1517. So 500 years basically after that schism, another big thing happens in Europe and England for a long time. Certain Christians. We're getting tired of the Roman Catholic Church. They still had all this power. They were telling people you could give money. to, You could sell indulgences. You could give money to the church and your loved ones get out of purgatory, hell, all kinds of what I would call nonsense. 
But they didn't know better because they couldn't read the Bible for themselves. It was only in Latin. And at that time, most people couldn't speak or read Latin. Only the Catholic priest could. They controlled everything in the service. Then what crazy thing happened? The Bible started being translated in the lingua franca, the common tongue of German. And at about the same time, roughly, Martin Luther, who had suffered from severe depression, he used to self-flagellate all the time about killing himself as a monk. Uh, his abbot, his father, said, dude, you got to get out of town, go take a vacation, go teach somewhere, go to university. He goes off to Wittenberg, he wants to be a university professor, well, he does what his leader tells him to as a monk, and he goes and learns all the languages. He learns Hebrew, he learns Greek, he learns Latin, and he starts reading his Bible for real changes his life. Imagine what happens when we read the Bible. He goes, wait a second, there's a lot of things we've been practicing and teaching for years in the Catholic Church that are nowhere to be found in the Bible. So he does what many, many people had done until that period, which is he wanted to have a conversation about it, a debate. And the way they did that was you didn't send him an email or a text. You took the document, you wrote it all up, and you nailed it to the front of a door. And he did it to the church in Wittgenburg. And he nailed it to the grant. It's called the Letter on the Disputation of Indulgences, or the 95 Theses, 95 different things. And you can read all this in English or in high German if you want to read that too, online or it's for free. And that was taken down and copied and spread like a wildfire, and it was is what lit the fuse on the bomb that was already been brewing for a while. It was that kind of water balloon, and, and it burst. All the local folk who were already tired of those Roman Catholics, man, it was now permission to let it loose. And it was a big firestorm. The Catholic Church didn't really like that. They were a little upset with Martin Luther. They, he's still Catholic. He wouldn't try to do nothing besides help reform the church, saying, let's get back to the Bible. They bring him in for hearings, a big, big ado, the emperor, I mean, a big deal. They bring him all in. He defends himself and on and on. They give him a chance to recant. Defend it. He defends it, never recants. And that's it. And they find him guilty. And before they can arrest him and get him, he is smuggled out and goes and lives in different towns for the rest of his life under a pseudonym wearing a beard and a fake mask and clothes and pretends to be someone else. But still writes documents. What? He was a marked man. But the people who loved what he said supported him. So he had, he had some uh, friends you know, in low places. And he starts writing documents. He still does against the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. And a lot of these documents, I've seen some of the originals. I mean, they're amazing. But at the same time, they really, really made fun of the Pope. They started getting very, very, very irreverent. Um, but that's what starts what's called the Reformation. And people who protested the Roman Catholic Church protested it are called Protestants. And this church and Methodist and Episcopalian, um, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Disciples of Christ, Baptist, Quakers, they're all the Protestant family. Because we do not believe in the superior order of the Pope. <coughs> We're not Orthodox. And so on the cover of the newsletter this month, I talk about that because at the end of this month is not just any old Reformation Sunday. It's the 500th year anniversary. And so I wanted to write a little cover to talk about that. Well, I was just curious, because when I was growing up, there was a school that lived next door to me. There were Mexicans, there were Italians. Oh. I mean, there were Mexicans, there were Catholics. Oh, yeah. And Bunny, her name was Bunny, and she was the only one that wanted to go to early morning mass. But she didn't like going by herself. So she talked to a little neighbor here into going with her. <laughs> and she had, I don't know how many of these little things that I had to put on my head. Mm. And I got in the church, there was, you know, a huge St. John's Catholic mm -hmm. Church. And stand up, sit down, kneel. Stand up, sit down, kneel. I didn't understand the word. Everything was in Latin. Mm -hmm. So I was just, I felt like a puppet, you know, mm -hmm. just <laughs> mimicking everybody else. And I could not figure, and then they're praying to the Virgin Mary. They're not praying to God, they're not praying to Jesus. They're praying to the Virgin Mary, and they're doing this number, you know. And I always wondered. A lot of those customs of praying to Mary and the sign of the cross are very yeah. ancient, that they started in Rome. Yeah. And there's a lot of features of Roman Catholicism that I like. A lot of features I do not like because by like I mean I think they misrepresent the New Testament understanding of Christianity. They disagree, that's fine. We just disagree. I still think, so, so to be real clear, and I say this on the cover of the newsletter, which I hope you'll read, Roman Catholics, Protestants and Orthodox, three major branches of the big, big picture, they're all Christian. They're all Christian. I hear people all the time, I'll say, so do you have practice of particular faith? They'll say, um, I'm religious, you know, I'm Catholic. And I'll say, okay, well, I'm Christian too. They go, no, I'm Catholic. Or what? They don't understand 
Catholicism is not a different religion. That's what most of them are told. <laughs> they act like it is. It's not. It's, not. It's, it's a branch of Christianity. Another branch is Protestantism. Catholicism has the most amount of people, particularly in Latin America and Africa. Latin America, it is booming. I mean, it is exploding. And uh, studies, I just heard a specialist, a sociologist, who, just the other day, he said that in places where there's an insurgence or a resurgence of Protestantism, Roman Catholicism burst up too. That it actually inspires them to, to be better Catholics. Um, for example, after the Reformation happened, I could keep writing more documents on the newsletter, they had a counter-reformation in the Roman Catholic Church. Because all the Catholics, like, what do we do about this, basically? They had another council to respond to those Protestants. Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin. It's called the Council of Trent, 1570, I believe. And they reinforced, we don't believe like those, and that was, I mean, it's but a little fun, a little anecdote. One day I was at a church, I worked at my very first Methodist church, this was back in South Carolina, back many years ago, and there was a couple that was in the class that I taught, and I was at the time working on Masters, and they said, we got to have you over to our house one time. I said, oh, I've been there. Okay, why? I got in to introduce our friend, I don't know his name, Bob. Why is that? Bob's a Catholic. Oh, Bob's a Catholic. And I go, okay, because I want to hear y'all debate. I want to, I mean, y'all have got, oh, I'm a kid. And I said, well, I appreciate that, but I, I don't like debating. I don't want to debate. And I'll be happy to talk, but I don't want to, oh, you got to, oh, you got to come. Gotta, I, can, I said, well, I'll be happy to talk. But he goes, oh, he's just, he's a good guy. He's just real passionate. And I'm like, okay, sure. We go over to dinner. Elaine goes there too, and she doesn't like having those debate talks. So I'm just meeting the dude, like, what's up? I'm like, chatting with him, no big deal. And then, uh, but anyway, he was, he was a nice guy, outspoken, but he's the most outspoken Roman Catholic I've ever met. What am I like? He just got grilled out. He, to him, he said, yeah, to us, the Council of Trent just happened. That was 500 years ago. And he's still talking about the Council of Trent and the Protestant Reformation and this and that. And, uh, but it was good. And, and uh, toward the end of it, he said, we need to have a debate. We don't have a university and yeah, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I told him something. I said, died. I'm happy to have conversations about this, but I'm afraid that breeds more disagreement, more. And I think the church doesn't need more of that. I think we need more of figuring out ways we're together than we do. So we never, but that was a long time of, I didn't do that. So I love my brother. My, my, I had a girlfriend for a long time in high school who was Roman Catholic. I used to go to her Roman Catholic church. And I was like, why is he doing that? Why does he have a staff in his hand? Why does he have a hat on his head? Why is he, stop asking the question. Why? I grew up in Baptist life. I'll never forget. We went there one night. It was a Friday night, Saturday night. And at the church, and I grew up in Baptist churches, moderate Baptist churches, and I went there on a Friday or Saturday night, and her mom and her stepdad, of course, were married. They'd gone to this party. I thought, I was going to, surely we'd go there. It's like some fellowship hall or something and some disco light from old people or something. And I go in there, and in the sanctuary, there were movable chairs, kind of like this, but fancier. They moved all the chairs out, and the dance floor was in the sanctuary. And outside the sanctuary were tables set up with beer on it in cups, like old red cups, where those yes, things are called yes, solo cups. Yes. Boy, I said, what? <laughs> I was laughing too when I said it. I thought, I could not believe I'm in the sanctuary. So, girl, I said, that was a big eye opener. And I told her, I said, Amy, what is that? I don't get it. I don't get it. Are you going to sacrifice a pig? No, it was that. But I thought that was, I was very much exposed to a different. Uh, uh, it, was it was funny back then, it's funny now, but I remember going, that was very uncomfortable. I thought, wow, how do you... I grew up in Lutheran Church, and we served the beer in the parish hall, not in the sanctuary. Oh, okay, in the parish hall, but not in the sanctuary in Lutheran, that's right. You, you have your limits. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course. You know, I've heard that old jokes, uh, growing up Baptist, you hear a lot of jokes about Baptists and Methodists. They said, what's the difference between a, a Baptist and a Methodist? And they go, what? Uh -huh. They said, well, there's a lot of them. One is... The Methodist will say hey to you when you're leaving the liquor store. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so there's all kinds of little insights. And if you're Baptist, you'll yeah. go to two or three counties away to buy your beer. Wow. So nobody in your... That's not so true <laughs> now, I guess, but there was a time growing <laughs> there up. There was a time. Um, I like the jokes. <laughs> we laugh at each other. Good. Anything else? You stay with him? Yes, ma'am. I, I watched Martin Luther on television. Oh, okay. Know, Martin Luther on TV. A or two ago. But the only, I just thought he was great. And But the only thing, uh, when they took communion, the uh, bread and the wine actually turned into the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what. That's what yeah, I heard that. Yeah, well, 
Uh, well, I can write if you want. Yeah, there are different views, the views of communion, or the Lord's Supper or Sacrament. The Roman Catholic Church believes in something called transubstantiation. And that is the belief that, and this is technical, using Aristotle, old, 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 old uh, terminology, they believe that the bread and wine turns into the substance of Jesus' body and fle uh, flesh and blood. Most Roman Catholics would argue they don't really believe it turns into the DNA and the literal blood, but on, and this gets technical, an ontological substance. It is, but not on the surface level. It is, but not, it's, an, it's a being in essence more than it is based on if you touched it, it's DNA or something like that. And it's a, a brain thing, isn't it? It's how you think of it. Yeah, it's how you interpret what happens. And they believe that. I, I don't find that compelling at all. But Roman Catholics believe you are re-sacrificing the body of Jesus every time you have Mass. And that's why for them, Mass is the central event of the church service. It is the essential. And it's also the reason why only the priests do it. And it goes way back then when the Romans, before they were Christian, the Romans had priests. And you had to do the sacrifice just right or the gods were upset. So when they became Christian, they just brought in the priests and brought it, and that, that's not in the New Testament. But that's why for centuries, the priests would gather, you'd gather like common folk like us, we'd sit there, we'd stand, and watch the priests come out in their, their robes, speaking Latin at a table way up in the front, the backs to us, as they looped around a big table and did all the da-da-da-da-da-da, Latin, da 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 they would do the, break the bread, all the little magic words, and then we'd come eat and partake. We just watch them basically have the service because it's the mass. They believe they're re-sacrificing, and that's how you get forgiveness. That's radically different from what Protestants believed. The, the middle of the road is called consubstantiation, that he's with the body and blood in a way. The other pendulum swing on the far swing side are people like Baptists, not maybe Quakers, but certainly Baptists. They typically believe it is merely symbolic. Merely, merely. So that's the pendulum is transubstantiation, to mere symbol, and I don't. I used to. I don't think that's biblical either. I think it's more like here. <laughs> I don't think it's constant. I don't think it's trend for biblical reasons. What What do we call it? Um, most Protestants would call it a. It's symbol. It's a symbol of what he's done, but we nuance that theology pretty well. At, uh, that he's present with us. At, uh, Catholic. Uh, think in present tense regarding mass, don't they? That's, they think of uh, mm. uh, Jesus shedding his blood and... Uh, yes, yes. They, have, you know, they think in terms of present tense. That's right. They think in present tense. That is right. They believe they're re-sacrificing the body of Jesus every time they have mass. He is being sacrificed for our forgiveness for sins when they do it. Uh, I do not think that's biblical. But they do think that. And, 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 I'll, and I'll end on this. Uh, I'll end on this just for fun. Um, just for a funny, well, it's funny to me. It may be funny to the Roman Catholics, but anyway. When Jesus has his communion, we do this every single Sunday here, right? And he passes around. He said, he took the bread, what? He blessed it. And he said, Take this and remember. This is. My body. my body. Take this right. Eat it. This is my body. He says, this is my body. He says it. He would have said in Aramaic. Well, I can read it in the Greek. We say it in English. But anyway, in Latin, the Latin translation of that, if this is my body, is hoc est corpus. This is the body. Hoc est corpus. If you say that fast, what does it sound like? Hocus pocus. That's where it comes from. Oh, no. Because they were making fun of Roman Catholics. They would say, oh yeah, go up there and say some hocus pocus. And boom, magically it turns into the body of Christ. That's where hocus pocus comes from. It's magic. So it's a, it's a pun slam on hoc est corpus. This is my body. There we go. And the uh -huh. reason, what is the reason they, their cross has Jesus still on it and the Protestant cross has Jesus not on it? That's a good question. I'm not sure why their crucifix still has Jesus on it. By most don't. Most Protestants don't. I know that part because the most, if not all, the early Protestant reformers, like Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, they were um, 
iconoclastic, iconoclasts, that is believed they were against icons, against any image whatsoever. So when the Protestants came to the, these Catholic churches and won over the church or kicked them out or whatever, they cleaned house. All those portraits of Mary and Jesus and the gold, sh they stripped it bare. I mean bare. And they moved the pulpit, which was from the side, where they just said some prayers or whatever. Because that's what we're going to kind of, what's in the middle is the table. They said, no, what's in the middle should be the preaching. They would say the preaching of the word. So the pulpit got moved to the dead middle. And the baptistry was put down lower above because those are the two things Jesus enacted with communion and baptism. And then communion table stone was put down low toward the people, but it was not center. Well, center was this. this. And so they took all the images down, including Jesus off the cross, because there was no image of it. Good question. That's the best I got on that. Why it's that way? Well, we won't keep going on because I don't want to introduce a new topic on Trinity um, in 30 seconds. But any questions or comments about anything so far? Anything? Good job. Y'all are hanging. Okay, I'm warning you. Next week, it gets a little more abstract because so far I've been using terms, you know, like Bible <laughs> and Paul and Revelation. I'm going to start introducing characters that you've probably never heard of, like Athenagoras and Tatian and on and on. So if you want, feel free to read ahead a little bit. Start working with the terms and we'll go slowly through that. And, um, you'll get it. You're smart. I'm just saying the terms are new. I've taught this before. This usually people start kind of freaking out and going, I don't know what's going on. So it's just the terms are new. That's all. No biggie. Can I say a prayer for us? Yeah. We thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit for guiding us. Help us lead us in all truth and help us, of course, of course, Spirit, be as a loving and kind to, of course, our sisters and brothers in Christ, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, all of them. Please help us be focused on more what we're united under you. There, as you know, God, there is so much upon which we do absolutely, fundamentally agree. There's so much, and I'm so glad of that, because it's true. Help us love them and love each other, and of course, love those who are not Christians. Help us be as kind as we can. Spirit, also help us have your wisdom so that we can understand more of you as you have revealed yourself and as you continue to reveal yourself. Please give us the courage to want to get to know you more and to acknowledge that you know us perfectly. Help those, please, that we know we come in contact with who ask about the Christian God. Help us try to articulate as best as we can the kind of God you are so that we're telling the truth and we're giving a more robust, full understanding of this Christian doctrine. And it's, of course, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 And we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you, David. You're welcome.